So, so now we're going to move on to uh, team, team commitment. Entertainment is one of those factors on team commitment. You need to maintain that, right? <laughs> so um, team commitment is a lot of different areas uh, in this area. I gave a pres I do these events all the time, so I always pick different topics. Um, one was, mo we did a topic a while back on motivating teams, sustaining teams, a bunch of other stuff. Um, with long-term projects, you have a lot of turnover. With long-term projects, you have turnover at the executive level, you have turnover at the mid-level, you have turnover at the project management level. Um, the, the, all, all three of you have come in at different times in these projects. So it, it's, it's um, and, and we talked about some other topics under team commitment, maybe, maybe we could bring it into here too, like differences between a project-focused team at the state versus just being in an organization where you have a lot of different projects going on. With, with your projects, it's singularity, right? You have a, a one focus. I'm on Camus. I'm on CalHERS. I'm, I'm on FizCal. I have to deliver this solution to my customer. So I guess what I'd like you to do is kind of maybe, um, um, Vicki, if you want to start first, is just talk about some of the techniques and stuff that, that you've Im implemented to kind of to keep the team committed, to keep people involved, to keep, this again, this is sustaining your project. And if, if, you had, if you have a lot of turnover on your projects, sustaining that team over time and meeting your goals and objectives becomes very difficult because institutional knowledge is gone. I mean, processes are broken. So if you could talk maybe about that. I really don't know about your project, by the way, so I'm not actually pointing <laughs> fingers. <laughs> so Camus isn't a single project, right? Camus is a program now. We, ma we merged the legacy side with the system replacement side. And so we have a program that we're managing. We have large, what we call system changes um, that are projects, right? The, the Affordable Care Act has created a lot of work. And so we're trying to manage all of that at one time. And so when this all started happening is when we were two separate organizations. And I was having conversations with my management saying, you know, there's no way that we can continue down this path. We've got to merge these two groups. We've got to make them one, right? And already the way it had been established, it created an us against them type of mentality, right? Legacy versus system replacement. <laughs> you're fighting over the resources. You're fighting over everything as you go along. So when we merged these two teams, it didn't miraculously go away. It just now they were sitting within, you know, dis talking distance of each other, having those um, um, battles with each other, right? It became kind of like a little bit of a hornet's nest. And it wasn't very long into that that I said, we have got to bring in some organizational change. The only way we're going to do this is if we start changing the culture. And I'm just going to share a story. The first meeting I attended when I became the project director um, at, um, uh, it was FIMUS at the time, right? Um, I walked into the room and there was this conversation going on and everybody was laughing, having a good time. And another individual walked into the room and you could literally <laughs> feel the air sucked out of that room. And I was sitting there going, what just happened, <laughs> right? It didn't take me very long to get what happened because they weren't afraid of, of showing me what was going on, right? Not only was the air sucked out, but there was these intense battles that were taking place. And so, you know, we brought in an organizational um, change um, um, leadership that helped me and my management team get a hold of what we needed to do. And what I realized probably within the first month I was there is it started at the management level. It wasn't just in the bowels of, you know, the great work that was being done. And that was the other thing that I didn't really quite understand because we were constantly meeting our deadlines for so much animosity and hatred to be going on. <laughs> Normally the first thing that you, you realize that you have a problem is because the work's not getting done. But the work was getting done, but there was still this, this total disrespect of one another and, and a, and a non-professionalism environment. And so we started working with our management team and, and had like all day sessions 
for six months, we, we did this whole exercise where we had to start learning how to talk to one another first before we could expect our teams to do that. So I think you, know, you have to take an evaluation of your organization. You have to understand that when you can't do it yourself that you need help to do it because you still have to get the work done as well. So we, we now have a culture environment. We have developed core values that the, that the um, project teams developed themselves that Camus developed and they all signed off on the core values and everybody is responsible for holding each other to those core values. We have our own mission and vision statement um, so that we can hold people accountable to that. So I say Rome wasn't built in a day, a culture is not going to change in a day. Right? Mm -hmm. When I first got there, people <coughs> were leaving right and left. We are now finally starting to get at, uh, at a place where um, staff is, is um, kind of settling in and knowing you know, what the expectation is and what their role is. So the staffing levels are kind of um, settling in. Um, but we still have people who are leaving who who were who we are mentoring and growing to become you know the next leaders of of today and so for me that's a hard balance right that you want to mentor and grow your staff but you're going to lose the ones that have all of that expertise and so you've got to be doing succession planning through the whole thing to make sure that there's somebody there that can take their place but organization organizational culture and organizational change and team commitment all all boil down um, into one thing for me. They're not separate items. I think if you don't have your organization where you want it to go and have a culture that is is worth to, worth being there, you won't have the team commitment, right? They will continue to go and, and leave, but again, for us, the work continued to get done and I'm always amazed. It's it's kind of like an oxymoron for me. I don't get it. I don't get how, how dedicated they are to getting the job done, but how willing they were to, you know, call their call their partner you know not nice names so um, we've done a lot of work in the last two years I'm very proud of where we've come have we achieved like I was saying no we have not achieved we have a long way to go but I'm proud of where we've where we've come from so this is probably one of the hardest topics for me because I will be truthfully truthfully say I don't have the answers I sure wish I did um, we started out so small, and it was a little easier then. It was easier to have a lot of team building activities to, to do fun events. We did tailgate parties, and we did, um, you know, Super Bowl parties and potlucks, and we did Thanksgiving potlucks and Christmas time treat days. And <clears throat> when you get up to the number of people we have nowadays, that's a little harder. And people are so busy working. It's hard to ask people to take, you know, take an hour and a half out of your day and come join us for a potluck. <clears throat> we did do a, <clears throat> where the management bought lunch for everybody just last month and just said, just at least come down and grab a sandwich. <laughs> Visit if you'd like. Um, it gets hard. Project work is really, really hard. It takes long hours, hard dedication. Um, like Vicki said, you groom people, you give them great skills, so you're happy to see the people go off to get promotions. You're sad to see the people leave that are just getting burned out and tired and leaving. Um, and, you know, any of these big projects are long-term commitments, and you're asking people to stay. The only thing that I can really um, see is really you need a management team that believes in the goal and the mission truly themselves who really really are committed and believe in what your project is trying to do because you can't expect your team to be committed and you can't expect them to buy into the hard work in the long haul if you're not it has to come from the top from your management team that you want success, that you believe that they're adding value, that you're adding value. I tell my team all the time, you are building the system that your children are going to use. If your children become state workers, they're gonna use the system. I mean, how cool is that? You're building, you're setting history for California and someday you can tell your kids, hey, I made your life better, trust me, you are not using paper <laughs> and pencils because of me. And that's value, that's value to the citizens of California, it's value to, you can feel um, success in what you do by working on this project. And 
Um, so, you know, that's the main thing that, that's the one thing that I can really hold to is I just really think it's, it's tough. Team commitment on a big project, a long-term project is really tough. But I think if you have a real strong management team who truly believes in the success of the project, I think your staff can feed off of that. Um, and I think that you can just really encourage the people and make sure they know that they're valued and that they're contributing. And you just have to make sure you keep sharing that message. Yeah, two things I would add. Um, one is um, that when you come into the team and whoever is, you know, whoever you're talking to on the team, one of the things that we always um, focus on, even though we are, you know, just ultra busy and we are all, you know, working harder than any normal person should work, but the but family comes first. So one of the things is that you always have to make sure, no matter what, um, that you are supporting your staff and your team when it comes to their their personal needs and their needs with their families and you know that you're you know that you're building that support network so that people can take care of um because if they're if they're unhappy you know i know it's a little bit cliche but if they are unhappy outside of work they're not going to be happy at work so um, that's one thing i i wanted to say and and you know sometimes it's hard because sometimes that means that people um, do need to be out when it's a critical time and you've got to have that support network to be able to to fill behind them um, the second thing I wanted to bring up and this kind of goes to what I talked about earlier is um, you've also got to recognize that um, that people are comfortable in different environments so for instance we are in the process of you know going from our development you know our pure development to more of an maintenance and operations um, mode and different people thrive in different settings so we're actually at a point right now where we are looking at um, some turnover um, because some people really thrive on that drive toward a very specific goal and some people really thrive on let me get all the processes in place so that we can have this you know, ultra well-oiled machine that's running our maintenance and operations organization. And you have to respect that and recognize that too. Um, I've, I've always believed that you know, everybody on your team wants to play, wants to be value added and wants to do, wants to feel good that when they go home at night, they've done something good there's very few people don't want to feel that way you know everybody wants to feel like they like they have contributed to the organization at the end of the day and um as a manager and as a leader um if somebody's not in the right role that helps them provide that contribution i think you have to help <clears throat> them get to a place in your organization where they can feel like that at the end of the day and sometimes that means that it's not in your organization you might have to help them get to you know like for like you know those people that want to be the drivers and they want to go towards one thing maybe i need to Vicky's organization. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah. so now that she's in her <coughs> system development mode, um, and then I said two things, but I actually have a third. Um, the other, the other piece of it is um, when you're working on these, you know, especially when you get into these bigger projects. Most off, more often than not, you're going to be doing these bigger project, these bigger projects with um, some type of systems integrator, and I think it's. It's very, very important to build the partnership amongst the entire team. Um, just like Vicki said, you know, she had her legacy versus her new development. Um, I see so many times where you come into, um, you know, and my, my experience, of course, is state projects. So, but I see so many times when you come into a state project where it's an us against them and the us is the state and the them is the systems integrator and you will never be successful in that in that that's not to say that you 
can't hold a vendor accountable. That's not to say that you're not going to have disputes with a vendor, but I've uh, but I always believe that those those kind of conversations about you know contract disputes and so forth um, need to be handled with a very very small group, and it does not and it should not happen publicly. <coughs> um, you know, somebody somebody said to me one time, you know, it, it, I won't name the particular project, but somebody said to me, you know. What, before you got here, people were quote, you know, staff were quoting contract terms <laughs> and in meetings. And it's like, how can you be successful when you have your programmer, you know, pulling out a 200 page contract and quoting it to the vendor about this is what you need to do? That's not, you know, it's not appropriate and it's not how you're going to get the job done. So, so, one area that we didn't really touch on, and this is your uh, trick question. <laughs> The, the, the uh, um, y y we talked earlier, the, the, um, the, they said every day is, is planned, but it's un everything that happens in the day is unexpected. <laughs> <laughs> so so one, of, one of the questions is, is team commitment. You really think about your team, say within the state, I, I never really thought of how do you maintain the interest and the commitment from the vendor? So do you guys have any ideas on that one or? I just thought of that one, by the way. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I'll just, I'll just. I, I think I, I kind of already said it. I know. What the, I, know you know, I felt you know, the hammer before, so I know what yeah, the hammer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I don't think. I, I mean, you know, your systems integrator, your vendor. I mean, the people that their employees are the same as your employees, um, and so they have the same challenges that we have as state managers. And um, so they have to do the same thing. They have to recognize that each person on their team needs to add value to the project. And that means, you know, and, and the big part of that means making sure that they're in the right roles to provide that value. So I, mean, I really think it's, it, you know, it's mm -hmm. the same thing as making sure that your people are in positions where they can be successful and they can be contributing to the success of your project. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine if my staff were willing to fight each other, what they would do to the vendor. Can we get a, like, we want a visualization. So three of you have to stand up. We want to see what that's like. <laughs> <laughs> Just imagine it, right? So we not only had a culture that we were dealing with internally, we had to bring the vendor, right, to the table as well and come to agreements on how we are all going to treat and behave with one another. It goes back, I think, to either Karen or Bravo or maybe both saying about that teamwork right about that collaboration and you know it to me it just boils down to the simple basic one-on-ones of human beings right is being respectful to one another you know you don't have to like the person that you work with but you you know I have an expectation that you should at least be respectful of them right and so we've we've had a long road again you know I'm here to say this has not been an easy you know an easy path I've been on but I'm I'm very you know anxious and and proud to say that you know we've made a lot of progress I don't see a lot of those old behaviors I see it in you know a few individuals and we deal with that on on individual basis but it is about being respectful to your vendor as well because our vendor people were going I'm not taking this anymore. I'm not being treated like this by the state. I don't have to do this, right? And they were leaving in mass. And so we have to, you know, get to the table and, and come to agreements about how we're going to interact with each other and how we're just going to treat each other. And it's been, it's been a long road, but I'm happy to say that I think we've, we've you know, achieved um, probably 80% of what I would like to achieve. <clears throat> I think um, as a state, we have had a lot of projects that have not gone well. And I think that we have become, um, as a lot of our state employees are distrustful. And what we, we call them the vendor. And they are the vendor. And I will tell you, I had a lot of people who worked for me who called them the vendor. That's why I'm standing way over here. Right? Yes. <laughs> and it's like, no, the, these are the people who sit next to you. And it was a real challenge for us because we had had that procurement where they were the vendor. You weren't supposed to talk to them. And now all of a sudden, no, these, these, are, your, these are your peers. They are your co-leads. They're your These are the people you work with every day. You are collaborating. And so it was a real hurdle. Uh, kind of all the way around to to 
you got to build that trust. But to, to try and change the mindset, and it's still a struggle. It is still a struggle. These are people. They're not the vendor. They are people. You, you, they have feelings. You have to treat them like people, and we expect them to treat us <laughs> like people. And, um, you know, and so we really try to drive home the same message that, that Karen talked about. If you ever get to the point where you say, but the contract, you stop. Conversation's done. Meeting is over. Discussion is finished. You do not that it's done and it is an escalated issue because I do not ever want two staff level people I don't want anybody below a deputy director having that if the contract says discussion so we just drove it home if you feel it if, you, if you're getting to that point because these are your co-workers they're your peers I don't want you I have a whole vendor management office and and I'm here and Tamara's here this is our job this is what we get paid for that's what they get paid for you guys shouldn't have to deal with that headache ever so if you ever get to that point, stop. Because I want you guys to have a good collaborative working relationship with, with, with your vendor counterpart. Any, any questions? No, you already asked one. It was too controversial already. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, let, let her ask one. Um, I've been at EV for 30 years, and I've seen a lot of vendors. I don't, I, I don't believe you, by the way. <laughs> and, and I think what you said about trust is exactly right, but it doesn't mean that you trust that you two agree that their interpretation of the contract and your interpretation is correct, but that trust that I've seen many on both sides, the state side and the consulting side, um, throw each other under the bus on something. Instead of talking to them first, they'll either go to upper management or go elsewhere before they discuss it. And, and that's pretty much the end of the relationship, mm -hmm. and, and the project is pretty doomed at that point. So I think that trust of, that they expect that, as the respect to happen is huge, mm -hmm. huge. Yep. But it doesn't mean that you just <coughs> look at the contract and say, this isn't what you're supposed to be giving us, or uh, from both sides. Yeah, understanding that the, the frameworks, again, we talked about earlier in the governance, <coughs> when you're, when you're building that relationship when you start a new project with a brand new team or a new company or a different set of team members from the same company um, it's it's important to have those discussions up front on how you're going to manage those communications and how you're going to manage escalation because you do run into difficult conversations on your projects right and sometimes you can't solve it at the level where you're at the two pms just don't agree on something and so there has to be that process to find otherwise everybody gets frustrated or they feel like they've been thrown under the bus um, so you need to talk about that up front and that's why your executive sponsors have to understand that framework as well um, and they need to know when you both members need to know when they need to go have that conversation with people and if you don't do that then you know again that's another contributing factor for why projects fail okay now you can ask your question right there. Well, that you've made and the panelists made. But the project, successful projects that I've been involved with, it always seemed as though the individuals that came on site were essentially treated like friends coming over to visit at your house for a while. And um, the working relationship was along that way, is that, that we are all here working towards the same goal. And that was foundation was laid because of the initiation of the contracts <coughs> and the management and the executives that were involved that ironed out the details for the communication plan, escalation, and what is for difficulties, how do we handle changes that come along. So that way when it came for the forces to come on site mm -hmm. to help in, in, in what we were doing, they were just one of us and we were just one of them. Um, and then likewise, it seemed, and yeah, my questions earlier were a little bit directed because I thought it would be beneficial, that also the successful projects that, that I've been involved with is whenever there was an issue where all of a sudden the state staff were starting to have a jaded viewpoint or an opinion, um, it was kind of helpful to say, hey, why don't you put on the glasses and take a look and realize that these folks that have come joined us for a little while, they are the people in the state of California. They are the people that we're here working for. And so if we cannot work collaboratively with them, then how are we ever going to provide something that meets the needs of the people in the state of California? Mm -hmm. 
So I'm kind of pulling on the heartstrings a little bit there. Kind of deflated some of the uh, acrimony that was there mm -hmm. and allowed for the, the issues to be escalated higher and handled appropriately by the appropriate level. But, but what makes that relationship healthy is making sure everybody knows what they're accountable for too, right? So when you when you have that they have that family party at your house and someone was supposed to bring dessert and they didn't bring dessert because now you got you got meet up and you've also got um, Evite and Eventbrite and all those things and they can actually tell you what they're going to bring <laughs> and when they forget it and they don't bring it you know expectations are deflated because you were really looking for that nice apple pie that they used to make or the caramel corn. 